Does any of this sound familiar? You assume the worst of people and imagine that they're judging you? You strive for perfection in every little thing you do at the expense of taking on new challenges or new opportunities or putting yourself out into the world? Do you worry more about pleasing others and the needs of others rather than putting yourself first and remaining dignified? Do you have emotional outbursts and you're not entirely sure why? All of these can be indicators of a problem with the ego, an unhealthy or wounded ego. And this is a series of episodes dedicated to becoming aware of these problems, partnering with our ego to begin working on the next chapter of our life and accepting what we can control and moving toward peace. If that's something you want, let's continue this journey together. Hello and welcome. This is Self-Control, How to Build a Better Life, the podcast that will inspire you to take control of your mind and your mindset to go forward and build that life that you deserve to live. And this episode is the third in a four-part series of healing your wounded ego, forming a partnership with your ego, and getting on the path to self-discipline, emotional control, and healthier relationships. So last episode, we talked about the first phase of this process, how to gain an awareness or an understanding of these problems of the ego. We talked about what the ego is, how it can create defense mechanisms and protective identities to keep us safe, but that those defense mechanisms and that protective identity often prevent us from growing, prevent us from progressing through life and lead to emotional and mental turmoil. Okay, so definitely check out the episode from August the 2nd that gives a full overview of this three-step process. And then check out the episode from August 4th, my birthday, for the beginning of the journey, the first step, that awareness. Today, we're on to step two, what I call incorporating the ego or becoming partners with your ego. Checking the ego and asking if maybe we can work together. So today, we'll talk a little bit more in depth, more specifically about how to use journaling and goal setting to begin this partnership, to move now from awareness to actual partnering with the ego, making the ego work for you, not against you. I'll give you a third practice to add to journaling and goal setting. This is a practice that I find very useful. It helps me sort of work with my ego and keep myself in check and keep myself honest. And finally, I'm going to give you three real life ways in which you can partner with the ego put the ego to work for you and begin this move towards acceptance. So you'll remember at the end of last episode, I gave you two behaviors, two practices, two things to start to start to foster an awareness of problems of the ego. Now, what were those two things? Number one, journaling and number two, goal setting. So through brutal, brutal honesty and, and daily consistency in journaling, you will start to see what story your ego is telling about you. So remember, the ego is our inner storyteller. It casts us as a character in a story, but of course there's so much more to consciousness than that, that if we get trapped in a story about ourselves that we're not consciously in control of, we can run into some problems. So the ego, and again, I'm no psychologist, we could be talking about the ego, we could be talking about a number of mental mechanisms here, but Suffice it to say, the ego is that part of our mind that is on the lookout for danger. It needs to constantly make judgments and it needs to constantly know where we stand in the context of what is going on around us. Now, the only thing about that is that what I have found and what I've researched is that the ego will privilege or will overemphasize negative information and it'll often steer us away from challenges or new experiences to keep us from being vulnerable, right? A classic example would be if you failed uh, in a public speaking engagement or in a, a, a presentation in front of your classmates and they, you were laughed at or you felt like a fool or you got a poor mark, a poor reception on, the, on, the, on your work, it, sa- it stands to reason then that the ego goes, well, we don't want to have that happen again. That was bad. We were up in front of everybody. We were judged. We felt like a fool. We might be cast out of the group if, we, if this continues. Public speaking is not for us and should be avoided. And yet you may still have to keep doing the public speaking. So then all amounts of um, emotional turmoil, uh, mental unrest, you know, negative feelings about it, um, perhaps 
perhaps leading to poor performance, stress, or taking on a, an, an identity that doesn't suit you just to get through the public speaking. Some people might even turn to alcohol abuse if they need to speak in public and they, and they can't do it. That's not uncommon either. So in the way that the ego begins to write a story about us based on past experiences, it can begin when it focuses on that negative information all the time to make us believe that we are a weakling, make us feel afraid of things. And quite often, we have to suppress who we truly want to be just to stay safe. So this is why I really advocate journaling. Journaling is a chance for you to start becoming aware of these defense mechanisms and this protective identity and the things that you are doing simply to stay safe. And so much of what goes on with the ego is, as I understand it, and as it seems to be for me, it's unconscious. So journaling now is making conscious that which is going on, at least that which is motivated unconsciously. And of course, with journaling, you are now literally writing your life story. You are now choosing to control how you think about what happened. And you can point and say, look, that's something that I was afraid to do. And I steered myself away from it. Why, why is this? And again, we don't have to go run out and change immediately, but we can start to say, look, there's something that I'm afraid of. It held me back. How do I feel about this? Did it, did it keep me safe or did it prevent me from taking on a new opportunity or being who I wanted to be? And so again, please check out the August 2nd episode directly before this one for some more information on, on journaling and how journaling can help you in this awareness of your problems of ego. And also I'll link it in these show notes as well. I have a list of 10, 10 or 11 defense mechanisms and 10 or 11 protective identities, right? So we talked more in depth last episode about those, but definitely check these out. These are ways that the ego tries to keep us safe by changing who we are, changing how we behave and sort of making us do things that, you know, we don't get the outcomes we want, but we take on this behavior as a way to stay safe and stay fixed and secure. You're going to want to look at these defense mechanisms and these protective identities and include that in your journaling. It's like, hey, am I being Mr. Tough Guy because of something that, you know, something that scared me when I was a child? Am I being a people pleaser because I, I'm out of control in my own life, but at least I can I can put myself fully into other people in an unhealthy way. And again, we have to remember now, when it comes to this journaling, this is going to take time, right? This series of episodes, I'm talking about a 25 or 30 year journey that I went on from a traumatic experience to today, being able to speak about it and being able to hopefully offer some guidance to other people. And, you know, a lot of that was unconscious. I didn't know what I was doing. I had to look back over those years. So I'm talking at least about an eight-year period of this conscious, deep self-work with a lot of failure and a lot of you know, trials and tribulations and repeated mistakes. So if you're willing to partner with your ego, realize that it, it's not going to happen overnight. Hopefully it can happen a little sooner for you than it did for me, but be patient and be ready to just do that work. But again, this is work that we're doing on ourselves, right? This is this is the what we're going to find is this is truly maybe the only work that we can really do. So through journaling now, you're retelling your life story. You're starting to take a little bit of the burden off the ego and say, look, let me write this next chapter. Here's something that happened today. And I actually think I know why I did that. And it might not be for the best, even though you're trying to keep me safe. You know, it's holding me back. It's making me it's making me upset. Let's write about that. Let's talk about that. And I really want to give you two quick tips here. As far as healing the ego, right? In your journaling, take a moment to, to write what you are grateful for. And you know what? Life might be hard. It might be difficult. You may have not a whole lot to be grateful for, or so you think. Take some time to just list off, I'm grateful that I was able to get up today. I'm grateful that I have a job to go to, that I have that one coworker who I can actually put up with and talk to. You know, I'm glad that I can go to the grocery store and yeah, I don't have a lot of money, but I can go to the grocery store and get the food that I need. I can get gas in my car. I live in this world where I can live a life, right? Start thinking about that because so often the ego focuses on that negative, right? What we're not, what we don't have, what we've lost. Take a minute or two every day to think about Man, am I glad for these things that I actually have. And secondly, this shift that we're talking about in this series of episodes is the move to conscious control of our behavior. A big part of that is mindfulness. And I really do believe that when you are 
into that groove of writing in your journal, writing your life story every day. When you're then out in the world living your life story, you're going to have that moment where you think, oh, I'm going to have to write about this. Maybe I should come to the moment here and think about, well, what am I doing, right? Mindfulness is attending to the task at hand, focusing on what you're doing. It's about having our thoughts and our behavior in unison, right? And those are similar, but it's about what I'm thinking about is what I'm doing. And here I am in the moment focusing on what I'm doing. And even if that's a moment where you get to be uh, thinking about the future, thinking about the past, embody that moment. Say to yourself, here now I am laying on the couch, lucky me. I'm going to now take some time to think about things. You know, your mind wants to fly off, but let's control it and say, here I am in my body, safe, Let's think about this. Or it could be something as simple as cutting up some carrots, washing a baby in the bathtub, things that we do in life every day. Look at that, feel that, focus on that. And then finally, mindfulness surely has to do with practicing that self-control, consciously choosing our actions. And it doesn't happen overnight, but through journaling, you can begin to realize all these moments in your life where you can live those moments, come to those moments, and begin to feel a fuller existence of life. And then when you have those moments where the ego says, don't do that, watch out for that, run away from that, get mad and scream and yell at that guy, hopefully this practice of mindfulness will open your eyes in that moment. And you may not be able to resist, but you can quickly look back and say, ah, that's where I lost my mind. That's where the ego took over. As you're starting to write your life story, you're going to now have some thoughts or some say in maybe how the next chapter is going to unfold. So let me ask you, how are you going to write your next chapter? This to me is where goal setting comes in. But let me tell you just a real quick story about my story. In 2015, I wrote, shot, directed, edited, casted, bought the food for, (laughs) drove the actors around. I made an independent short film. Actually, it's a feature length film. It is on YouTube. I'll put the link in it if you want to see some of my early work. <laughs> it's uh, I'm still proud of it to this day. But the process of making a movie, especially when you're the one guy doing it on no budget and trying to manage locations, people, food, props, scripting, shooting, lighting, it's a very stressful experience. And what happened to me that summer was I really got into overeating it and not drinking to excess, but drinking a fair bit. And you know, especially you go out to buy a bunch of food for the cast and crew that night, you bring all the leftovers home. It it became a real, real problem where I was just laying on the couch eating until God knows when in the morning. And you know, it became a real problem. And I, I had to talk to my psychologist about it at the time. And so there's an example then of basically existing on autopilot. I had stress. And as we know, I had a traumatic experience in my younger years where it the proclivity, the tendency, the love of overeating became a big way to soothe any pain that I came across. So through some therapy and through some writing, I started to think, okay, here's a problem where essentially I didn't know it then, but my ego was out of control. I'm just force feeding myself every night to numb or to feel better. I then had to set a goal. This is how we take control of the next chapter of our life. We say, okay, my ego's got me here. I'm taking over now. I set a goal. I discovered a diet called the slow carb diet and I was able to through the end of 2015 and into 2016 I was able to actually lose 20 pounds. I read my life story I realized that my ego loved to remind me of that painful past this stressful present and I began to act to self-soothe and I used food to do that I had to decide consciously once I was aware the next chapter will be different so I set those goals, find a diet that works, stick to that diet, track your weight as you go along. Through goal setting, we take conscious control of writing the next chapter of our life story. So let me ask you now, if you have some awareness of how your ego is protecting you, right? It's steering you away from challenge. It's looking for ways to just sort of soothe and numb and experience pleasure. If there's behaviors that you're doing on autopilot, right? Where you're having emotional outbursts here because you don't want to have the hard conversation at home, whether it's people pleasing, 
whether it's ignoring your own needs or whether it's focusing completely on your own needs only, are there things that you're doing to sort of stay safe, stay secure, stay fixed that are keeping you from growing and they're leading to unhealthy outcomes in your life? The question I have for you is if you're becoming aware of this now, is there, is there some goals that you can set around that to start to minimize the bad outcomes, to start to partner with that ego, to start to say, hey, I see what you're doing here. I think the next, the next step, the next chapter is going to have to be a little bit different. Let me give you just one more quick example from my life story to sort of illustrate this. So as I explained, when I was a young boy, I did have a painful traumatic experience related to my body. It required surgical correction and uh, it led to a lot of, um, well, (laughs) it led to this moment right here and it was a long road to get here to be able to understand how my ego played into that. But, you know, when I was in my late teens and early 20s, uh, marijuana became a huge way for me to deal with this sort of unprocessed pain. And I look back on it now and I formed a protective identity as being someone who was a recluse, someone who was also a victim, right? I love to say, well, I've been hurt. I'm special. I'm different. I'm compromised. Whenever I get the chance, I run away down to the river to smoke weed alone or I smoke weed with my one other friend who had (laughs) whatever problems of his own, I suppose. I formed that protective identity that justified all that rather than doing the work of healing the pain that I am doing now. (laughs) I said, well, I'm a victim. I'm a recluse. I run away. Now, the unfortunate thing and the way some of this stuff is so sinister is is marijuana really messed up a lot of things for me. My social relationships, um, again, formed this identity around it where I wasn't being fully myself. And for whatever reason, however it works, it gave me those emotional problems, right? I would have emotional outbursts or I would would spend so much time high thinking about uh, the problem and the pain and how I wasn't getting what I wanted that... When something would confront me in real life, I would snap and explode and have this emotional outburst. It's worth examining your behavior. I couldn't do it then, so I can't tell you to do it now, but I can just say to you, this would be the next step for you. If there's something that you're addicted to, if there's things that you're doing to escape, not only do those things come as a sort of a consequence or as a result of your ego trying to keep you safe, but it reveals to us exactly where the pain lies. Because I felt like a recluse, right? I withdrew socially. What what it turned out to be the case was that I had to put myself out into the world and be social. I had to stop seeing myself as a, a special victim. And I had to see myself as someone in high self-esteem that could go out and contribute. All of this took years, but It's through that self-examination that took place in the journal and in the goal setting, right? It's like, look, can I lay off the weed maybe and maybe be a productive member of society? What would that look like? The things that we do, we're so often, we're we're so eager to change because we know it's wrong, but we got to take that step in the moment and say, look, those things that I'm doing, those reveal to me exactly what I must do if I want better outcomes. It's not run away from that life like you've been running away from everything else. It's stop in the moment and look at exactly what you're doing that will tell you where those next steps lie. And so as I asked you at the beginning, whether you're having problems with assuming the worst in others, believing that everybody's judging you, that can be a form of projection, right? Projecting your inner pain onto the outer world. You're striving for perfection or familiarity at the expense of trying something new. You're more interested in pleasing other people or putting all your efforts into being a protector, a caregiver, leaving your own needs unmet. Or again, you have these emotional outbursts because you're trying to protect yourself from perceived threats. So you lash out, desperately need to suppress that emotion, but then it comes out at the wrong time. Or you're constantly living in this cycle of negative self-talk. At least I can control the negative self-talk, right? I can keep bashing myself, but the more we do that, we walk ourselves to the edge and Like I say, we can just explode when the slightest thing happens. All of those are examples of the way in which we deeply desire control in this life. And the ego really, really desires control, especially when that traumatic experience, that pain, that loss had us surrendering our control. So then we find ourselves trying to reclaim control in areas of of our life that we can't fully control. You know, your ego wants stability, predictability, comfort, familiarity. It's building a map of the world and it's building a map of your identity and how you relate to the world. It needs consistent 
reliable information, but a lot of the times it fills that gap, it assumes a lot, and it repeats itself. It tells you, look, you got hurt pretty bad back there. I think the world is probably a bad place. It might be best if you just kind of stayed here and didn't go out and didn't test yourself. And you know what? That was a really terrible relationship you had with that person. That person seems to be kind of the same. Maybe we could try again with that person. But what happens then? The same old recurring patterns. The ego tells you to stay put, to stay in the groove, to repeat yourself, to do the same things. Because through that, we might believe we can get back some control. But here's the shift that we need to make. We need to get away from controlling, trying to control what we cannot control and begin to control only what we can. That is our self. So now what we can actually do is begin to sick our ego, to train our ego on these new desires and these new goals. And so let me tell you quickly that next to journaling, and goal setting, add this practice of tracking, right? If you set a goal, track whether you succeed or fail. And what that'll ultimately do for you is allow you to see where you fall short. Like for me, again, I'm in this phase of trying to trying to lose weight, trying to lean out. Okay, so I write down what I'm going to eat. But sometimes that self-control, it gives way. And I, I, I eat more than I'm supposed to, or I eat stuff that I don't want to. Track that. Be honest. Just as honest as you are with your goal setting, you need to be with how you're tracking whether you follow through or not. And you don't have and of course the ego is going to want to put some shame on that, right? Put some guilt when you fall short, but this is the beginning of a shift where now we're saying, okay, all these things that I'm trying to do, these goals that I want now, I see now that I'm trying to write my own life story and here's what it's going to look like. These steps are too big. These steps hurt. Can I, can I slow down? I don't want to stop, but can I slow down? Can I piece those goals into even smaller and smaller things? Can I appreciate the nature of the fact that it's going to take a lot of time? What I've experienced in myself is that in some strange way, I've rewired, I don't know if I've rewired my ego, I've rewired my nervous system to now the goal becomes more important than the safety, right? It's like, okay, it is going to hurt that I don't get to fill my face with rice and cheese and bagels and Chinese food and smoked meat and McDonald's and pour a few beers on top of that. That's, that's not fun that I have to restrict myself from that. But wow, look, if I could do that for a week, I could lose a couple pounds. That feels pretty good. That's the shift we're making now. The ego has us doing things that we're out of control, eating, drinking, being someone we don't want to be. Can we now say to the ego, look, I understand why you've done this. Can we partner together now to write the next chapter where, yeah, it's not going to be fun. It's, it's probably going to hurt to start, but I want to take a step forward to being who I really am. I want to take a step forward to a goal, not just this staying put and being safe. I want to progress. I want to start climbing the mountain. The thing is, the ego, when a, a healthy ego wants to wants to assert itself, wants to have high self-esteem, and you can get there. So I want to tell you now three ways, three things that you can do to begin to partner with your ego and to start to make this shift. For me, routine becomes the number one thing. We know all these things that we can't control in life. We're becoming aware of them. Our routine, what we do with our physical body. Like I call this phase, this step incorporation because it has to do with our corpus, our physical body. We're trying to take conscious control of our actions. So sleep, diet, exercise, work-life balance. All of those things have infinite potential for self-control, for things that we can control. And yes, there's nights when you're not going to get a good sleep. Yes, there's nights when you're going to let go and, and eat and drink and go crazy. But you can, over time, target your routine. Get to sleep regularly. Okay, you have a problem with sleep? Let's address that. Is it stimulants? Is it blue light? Look, there's a bunch of things you can do. I don't have much more time to keep going into this. But think about this. The number one thing that you can control is what you do day to day as much as possible. But even to say, look, yeah, I have to work. I have to pick the kids up. Okay. 
allow that. Don't just do it mindlessly. Put it in and say, I'm going to go here. I'm going to show up here. I'm going to do this, this, and this. And in my free time, I need to address my diet. I need to address my sleep. This insane need for control can be channeled inwards on the self. That's what this whole show is about. You get to set the tone. You get to write the story. Within your body is the potential for deep, unflinching control. You can't control them. You can't control the outside world. But you can control yourself. Secondly, let's start to address our addictions or our bad habits. And I've said before, I can't necessarily help you if you have a serious addiction. I would like to think that some of what's going on in this show can be a tool in your toolkit if you're looking to beat addiction and bad habits. But be aware, this is where your ego has driven you in the needs of safety, in the interest of comfort, in the interest of freedom. So write about these things. Begin to deal with them. Set those goals around them. Start that shift, start that partnership with the ego and say, look, I know that I drink a lot because, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of what happened to me in my past. I don't want to think about it. Could I drink a little bit less this month? Could I, for the love of God, make five minutes to maybe write one word about that thing that happened to me that I'm trying to forget? That addiction will reveal to you those next steps. And again, You have this insane need for control. It's like, I love to feel good or I love to not think about things, so I use alcohol. But that's not going to give you the outcomes you want. Can we now take that insane need for control? The ego can say, "Ah, I really want to get my hands on something. Well, let's get our hands on the problem that we've made, not the problem that we had. And thirdly, I would really recommend take on some kind of challenge, some kind of project. Try something new. Like for me, a lot of what spawned this work, like I said, was when I made that film uh, eight or nine years ago. It was a major challenge. I had to put myself out there. I had to put my ideas to the test. I had to learn to deal with people, go to local businesses and ask for help. Ask for help from my friends when I had no money. Plan something, schedule something, be a leader. It's not going to happen overnight, but find an arena in which you can do that work. And and realize that it could be a new hobby. It it could be something that gets you uh, physically active. It could be something that gets you in front of people. It could even just be taking an online course, right? Like you want to learn about chat GPT. You want to learn about Bitcoin. You want to learn about electrical engineering. You don't have to leave your house, but you can commit to doing something that's going to push you out of your comfort zone. It's going to make you have to build a routine and challenge yourself. Because the truth is a healthy ego It wants to assert itself. It wants to have high self-esteem. It wants to go out and test the boundaries of reality, right? Like, as I understand it, the ego mediates between our inner desire and the outer world, and it helps us, it guides us in in a way as to get what we want in a way that's socially acceptable. So why not take a little bit of burden off the ego and say, look, you kept me safe for all those years and I thank you. I'm ready to grow now. I think we need to work together. I think I need to challenge myself. I think I need to grow. I think I need to maybe set some new boundaries in this relationship I'm in that's not working. Taking the burden off the ego of writing your life story and and writing that life story for yourself, becoming aware of how you were hiding and running and scared and not being yourself to now setting goals around a new life for yourself and using that desire for control, using the ego's power using the ego's insane ability to process information and say, this is what I need to do. I'm going to try and fail, try and fail, try and fail until I start getting somewhere. This is kind of the process I've undertaken. I had my traumatic experience. I began to realize, I began to realize that I can't control a lot of things. I can't control what people think about me. I can't control the pain that I suffered, but I can begin to put myself out into the world and rage against that pain, fight against that pain, process that pain, put my body into life, exercise, diet, bring myself to bear upon the world, talk to that girl at the bar, talk to that guy at work and form a relationship, have the hard conversation here at home, be there for my parents, be there for my friends, whatever that looks like. It's about activity and going out into the world rather than staying put That's how we grow. I'm going to leave it there for now. And I really encourage you to start writing that next chapter of your life. Partner with your ego. 
Start setting some goals for yourself and see where you can go when you are the author of your life story, not that guy in the background who's based what he thinks about you on the past and negativity. This is about positivity and activity and going forward. So next episode, we're going to finish off this series. We're going to talk about that final step. We've partnered with the ego and now we are moving forward to acceptance, truly letting go of what we can't control. And I'm going to use the context of emotional outbursts or emotional regulation as well as relationships, right? So often a wounded ego really leads us down a dark road as far as our emotions and as far as the relationships that we get into or the relationships that we uh, stay in and fail. So I'm really looking forward to wrapping that up for you guys. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Please remember until we speak again, better is possible.